good, honest, genuine people will have you going north, south, east, and west at the one time. Seriously. You talk to this brother, talk to this sister, talk to this brother, talk to... And honestly, they can all give their opinions, but there's only one who really knows. And if he has already spoken to you, then that's it. First Samuel chapter 17, and we'll start at verse 32. We break into this story, a very famous story. Uh, Goliath has been taunting Israel. I think he, it was 40 days. Just mocking, taunting the people of God. And of course, then a young man comes to the fore called David. And this young, inexperienced shepherd says unto the king, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Goliath, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. You can nearly feel his disdain, like this Philistine, this man. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion, this is his response. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine, this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he is said to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. I've called this message this morning, God uses simple, ordinary, imperfect people to accomplish extraordinary tasks. God uses simple, ordinary, imperfect people to accomplish extraordinary tasks. One of the greatest misconceptions that we can be under is that we need to be a perfect Christian with a perfect credentials and a perfect resume before that we're actively usable to be that God can actually use as an instrument in his hand. Well, that's not true. Amen? Amen? I think we've all had our moments of believing that we're not good enough uh, to serve the Lord in any capacity. We've all had our moments, if we're honest. Uh, we look at our own weaknesses, our own inadequacies, and we feel we're not qualified to serve the one who is pure, who's righteous, who's holy, who's perfect. When we're young, we convince ourselves that we're too inexperienced. When we're older, please know I said older, not old. When we're older, we think that we're past our sell-by date. So it's time to just sit in the departure lines for another 25 years and do nothing. When we fail, we think we're not faithful enough. We can also look around ourselves and compare ourselves to other believers and imagine that we're not knowledgeable enough or we're not smart enough to be serving God. Our giftings don't come up to the standard of our brother over here or our sister over there. If that doesn't work, the devil will try and convince you that the season's not right or your family circumstances aren't right or...
could be anything's not right. I mean, literally, whatever works, the devil will actually use it to tell you that it's not the time or you're not the person. There may be problems at home. There may be problems in the workplace. There may, may be problems somewhere in your circle. I think there's a choir in the back here today. <laughs> I listened in this past week to a, a quality pastor open up his heart. And he was having problems in the home. And he said, sometimes it's not working at the present in the season that you're going through. And therefore, you think you have no authority or right to speak on a certain subject. This is what he said. He was discouraged with what he was going through to such a degree that he had made up his mind he was going to resign from the ministry. But God spoke to him. And he said this. This is what the Holy Ghost told him. There may be things that are not working in the house at the moment, but that does not disqualify you from preaching on that subject. A fellow pastor, he opened up to a fellow pastor that he looked up to in the faith. And this is what his fellow pastor, this leader, said to him. God had two children in the Garden of Eden. They were raised in a perfect environment. They had perfect communion with the Father. And yet they both failed. He did not resign from being God. Amen? Amen? One thing that you quickly learn in the Word of God is that what Scripture defines as success and what the world defines as success are two completely different things. When you study this book, you realize that God uses simple, ordinary, imperfect people to accomplish extraordinary tasks. Qualification for divine service involves having a personal relationship with Him and being willing to step out in response to Him. I do also think it is important to have no confidence in yourself if you're going to serve Him. But we're living in a day where it's all about your resume or letters after your name. Um, you know, I hear preachers, whenever they meet, and uh, well, what Bible college did you go to? And what qualifications do you have? It's nearly their, their, the introduction to their conversation. And once people start to talk like that, it's like, I think there's things that are more important. Now, if you're a born-again believer this morning, you do have letters after your name. You're a BA, you're an MA, and you're a DD. BA, born again. MA, made anew. DD, devil disturber. Amen? So if, you know, whenever the proud come to you and start to boast of who they are and what they are, just let them know who you are. You're a BA, you're an MA, and you're a DD. And I'm not in any way belittling qualifications, by the way, so please don't take that out of what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, the Lord's not looking for that. The Lord's looking for a simple, humble, available person who's willing to take him at his word. Would you agree? In fact, if you looked at the qualifications of a lot of the people that he used in this book, they probably didn't have much. Um, I want to say this, that there's qualities and abilities that you bring to the table that I don't have. There's qualities and abilities that I bring to the table that you don't have. That's not all. There are provisions that you can bring to the table that I can't bring to the table. There's provisions I can bring to the table that you can't bring. There are opportunities that you get that I don't get. But there's opportunities that I get that you don't get. Do you understand how it's so important that we don't look down on our brother or our sister just because we're doing this and they're doing that? 
That is insane. And you see a lot of that in circles where people are trying to impress. Thankfully, I, I never feel it in here. I never feel that we're all jockeying for position. Who's the best of the best? The only best of the best in this house is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. All the rest of us are on the one level. We need him every single day. Every one of us. And God forbid that any of us should elevate ourselves above the next one. God forbid. You need to see how unique that you are. And how unique your journey in life is. There's nobody like you. There's absolutely nobody like you. You could even have a twin who's alive today somewhere. And their journey is completely different to yours. You may look alike. You may even talk alike. You may even walk alike. But I can tell you what. You two are completely different. Your experiences and journeys are going... You're not with each other 24-7. You're not going through the exact thing at the exact same time. Now, while the call that God has upon every believer is distinct, you need to realize that you are deliberately designed to accomplish a particular mission in this day. By the way, you're not an accident of birth. You do not find yourselves living in this, this day by chance. See, one of the most foolish things to hear Christians saying is, well, I wish I lived a hundred years ago. Or I wish I lived back in, in the days of the reformers. Or I wish I lived back in the days where it was a horse and cart. Well, it wouldn't be long before you're missing your cell phone. Or your laptop. Or your car. Or going to Walmart. <laughs> Huh? If you want some date, you might have to go out and kill it. <laughs> what I'm saying is we're born in this day for a reason. And the other thing is life is not aimless or pointless for a Christian. So if you're saying, well, I don't know why I'm here. Well, I can tell you, you're here for a purpose. And God knows what that purpose is. I want to look this morning uh, real quickly at two young men that seemed naturally inadequate and unprepared for the task that was before them. Yet both of them were marvelously used to supernaturally leave a mark in this life. All because they were willing and available. That was it. They were willing and available. I want to look at David, who defeated Goliath, and I want to look at the little boy who helped feed the 5,000. One in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And I wrote under this, basically, cometh the hour, cometh the men. The need was there. God raised up an answer to the need. And I can tell you in this hour, there's a need out there. But there's not just a need. There's always God raising up someone to meet that need. If they're willing to do so. The problem in America today is there's a need out there and the answers within the church out there, but people aren't actually stepping out to meet the need. Then we wonder why there's no revival. These young servants of the Lord, these two young men, were the right people at the right time with the right materials to accomplish the right thing. They were in the right place at the right time because that's what God does. He is sovereignly moving the chess pieces to where he wants them to be. David is the first young man I want to look at. He was a young hired hand. All that he was equipped with when he confronted Goliath was a sling and five stones. That's all he had, which wasn't much. Didn't look much, but it was enough. In fact, everyone who spoke to David questioned his credentials. They thought he wasn't qualified. And that's one of the most dangerous things about God laying something upon your heart. Don't go and ask 10 people what do they think. Do you know why? You'll have 10 different answers. 
good, honest, genuine people will have you going north, south, east, and west at the one time. Seriously. You talk to this brother, talk to this sister, talk to this brother, talk to... And honestly, they can all give their opinions, but there's only one who really knows. And if he has already spoken to you, then that's it. That's all that matters. But listen to David's brothers in 1 Samuel 17, 28. Whenever he steps forward to meet the need. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your naughtiness of heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Basically, can you get what he's, can you get the atmosphere and the, the attitude here? He was like, who do you think you are? Listen to King Saul. In our reading this morning in verse 33, 1 Samuel 17, 33. And Saul said to David, thou art not able. Huh? You're not able. Thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Listen to Goliath, or what it says about Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 42. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. By the way, it didn't look good here for David, did it? If David was a people person, and if he was led by popular opinion, how do you think he would have dealt with this? Do you think we would ever be talking about the story of David and Goliath if he took the counsel of man? I don't think so. But this young lad found himself in the right place at the right time with the right equipment to undertake the right task. And there's a lesson here for us, by the way, before we go any further. Be careful who you receive from. Be careful who you receive from. Be careful where you get your counsel. Surround yourself with people of faith and vision, not people of negativity and unbelief. David brought what he was to the table. And it wasn't much. I mean, looking on, if we were watching this battle, and I've been to the Valley of Elah, I actually, whenever I was at the Valley of Elah back like about 25 years ago, I actually, they told us anyway that this was the stream where he got the stones from, and it was dry. So I went and got five stones from it, and I put it in my pocket, and I took it, and I've still got some of them in the house, by the way, in case the Israeli police are still looking for me. <laughs> <coughs> but... I stood in the Valley of Elah, and I can imagine it. And if we were watching that battle, we honestly would be shaking our heads going, this is going to be embarrassing. Even the strongest of believers must have been wondering, what's happening here? By the way, there wasn't too many of them standing with David. He's standing there alone. Where is Israel? Where's all the mighty men of Israel? Where's Saul? They're all hiding in the trenches. Every one of them. Don't let Satan, don't let people, don't let circumstances define who you are and what you do. Let God. Now, if you're on a wrong path and you're not listening to God you should take godly counsel. Amen? I mean, God will bring somebody along. If you're being stubborn and you're being bullheaded and going the wrong direction, it is good to take godly advice. But I'm talking about if God is speaking directly to you and you're hearing Him, it is very smart just to run with what God tells you. Maybe it seems like no one has any confidence in you. Maybe it seems like at the moment you've got no encouragement to keep going. Well, here's how David dealt with it in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. 
But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Sometimes you just have to talk to yourself. Amen? Amen. Who talks to themselves here? Come on, the rest of you. Who talks to themselves? Okay. Thank God for 80% of you being honest in this house. Huh? Sometimes it's good to talk to yourself. I'm glad people don't listen to me when I'm talking to myself. <laughs> but it's good to talk to yourself. David encouraged himself in the Lord. You can imagine him saying, David, stay strong. Be bold. Don't let that jerk intimidate you. <laughs> I didn't know whether to say it or not, but I had to get it out, okay? Uh, honestly, you can imagine him talking to himself. Or do you think he would say something like that? Or maybe he called him a clown, okay? But he was a clown, by the way. He was a fool. Amen? I can tell you it's a fool to defy the living God. It's a fool to defy the army of the living God. So whatever he was saying, I can imagine him. Just don't get, don't get put off here. Just keep going. Just put him down. First punch will do it. Or first stone. What I'm saying is stop trying to please everybody around you. Stop trying to conform yourself to what others want or think. Stop conforming yourself to the worldly mindset out there. We're living in a liberal day where everything out there is trying to conform us to their stinking thinking. Come to God the way you are. Let Him influence you. We have something called influencers today. Have you heard of them? Influencers. What are those influencers? They're trendy, popular, what? What are they? Bozos. No, not bozos. <laughs> I mean, these are, a lot of them genuine people, amen? They're, they're not influencers. They're probably doing it for money, but they're, they're, they're genuine in what they're doing. But I can tell you, them influencers can take people away that way. Or away that way. Just whatever the latest fad is or whatever way the wind's blowing they go that way and they bring thousands of people with them but we're not like that the people of god are not like that we go by what god says and by what god thinks they used to say when i was young you can please some of the people some of the time but you can't please all the people all the time okay if you're with god i'm telling you don't don't keep Asking people, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Th that's dangerous. Honestly, I, like if I did that as a pastor, honestly, I don't know. It, like, I'd be scared even to ask this morning again, how many people think it's too warm in here? How many think it's too cold? How many thinks it's just right? Huh? Because we always get the same answer, like three different opinions. Well, let's put it to the test. Who thinks it's too cold in here this morning? Be honest. Okay, okay, o over here. Who thinks it's too warm in here this morning? Okay, who thinks it's just right? <laughs> okay, I rest my case, your honor. Do you understand? There's just a simple example. We're all in the same place, experiencing the same environment, and yet we're all going three different directions. Who doesn't know? <laughs> that, that, that's north, south, east, and west. <laughs> who just simply doesn't know? Or who, do, who just wouldn't put up their hand? It wouldn't matter what I asked you. <laughs> do you realize there's people in there, it doesn't matter what question I've asked for 14 years, they never put up their hand. And it's like, so we'll put them under the don't knows, okay? But Saul told David that he wasn't qualified, he wasn't equipped. And this is what David said. Thy servant kept his father's sheep. He goes on to talk about he dealt with a lion and a, and a bear who come to destroy the little lambs. He took, took them by the beard. He killed them. 
And he said, basically, the God that's done that back then is going to do this with him. That clown, that fool, Goliath, is going to be just like that bear and that lion. What confidence. Remember, this is just a simple shepherd boy. But, and I want you to hear what I'm about to say, but he was a simple shepherd boy with experience. He proved God when no one was watching, when no one was about. And I would say this, that that is so important when it comes to effective ministry. Experience is invaluable. Charles Haddon Spurgeon says this. He tries to encourage the people on this story. I would have you take care and kill your lions and kill your bears that you may store up your experiences and be able to kill your Philistines. How can you expect God to do the miraculous in the big times when you've not proved them in the small times? How can you expect God to publicly work through you when you have not proved him privately? Are you with me this morning? You know, we think that ministry, serving God effectively is on a pulpit like this. This is just a small part of the picture. There's such a thing as life, the Christian life. Proving him out there when there's no one about. What you're having to go through today could be important to what you're going to go through tomorrow. You deal with it good today, you're probably going to deal with tomorrow's battle better. David didn't come with all the fancy credentials after his name. He didn't have the war experience that Saul had. What did he come with? He came with the Lord. Do you know that God has ordained the day you're born, what you're going to go through, the family that you're born into, your personality, your talents, your giftings, your circumstances that you would face. God has ordained all that. By the way, he's ordained your personality. That personality can function in the flesh or in the spirit. But he has sovereignly ordained your personality. It's not some big accident. He's placed you where he wants you. The timing of your life here has been carefully calculated for you to accomplish his purposes. The $64 million question is this. In the light of that, are you prepared to obey God? Now, after David's boldness, and he wouldn't step down in front of King David, David knew that he was, he was going to go to battle. So what does he do? He tried to put his armor on him. He says, okay, come on, I have a room back here you need to come to. Uh, and this is what he did. He took him and he armed David with his, his armor. He put on a helmet of brass upon his head. He armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor. But it didn't fit right. David wasn't comfortable in that armor. It just didn't feel right. Do you know why? He hadn't proved it. He hadn't proved it. A lot of the times we're trying to put on Saul's armor and we're wondering why are we not being effective in ministry? Why are we not having fruit? Or we're trying to be like him or we're trying to be like her. And it's not working because we're not meant to be an actor on a stage. We're meant to be ourselves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We just have to be ourselves. Warts and all. Weaknesses, shortcomings, frailties and all. Be ourselves. That's what he used here. That's what God used here in this young man. And this story tells us it pays to go with what God has given you rather than what man tries to force upon you. It's very tempting to go with what seems right, sounds right, looks right or what's the latest fad it's easy to go with the, the crowd even preachers today 
I was, I think I was talking to Elijah or somebody earlier. I was talking about preachers today. You can even get it if you go on to certain YouTube uh, channels that um, the teachers of preachers today are saying, don't mention the Bible for the first 15 minutes of your sermon. Why? Because you'll turn people off. So this, the latest fad today is just talk about life. Talk about what's happening out there. Draw people in. And then after 15 minutes, just nice and subtly introduce the Word of God. And you'll get them hooked before they even know they're hooked. That's the counsel. I, I remember watching a YouTube video. I he- heard this name of this, this pastor that was actually getting the young, up-and-coming evangelical preachers, teaching them how to be effective in this day. And it's like, people don't want to hear, they don't want to come into church on a Sunday, and they don't want to be beat over the head with the Word of God, so don't start there or they'll, they'll not come back. I'm like, whoa, whoa, this is another gospel. But that's where, that's where we're going today. Brother, sister, if the Word of God is not enough, then we might as well give up. This here is the voice of God. <coughs> Faith cometh by and hearing by. That's it. Why do so many Christians try to use what they haven't proved? Why do they look to natural man and his help or what he has designed rather than what God has designed? By the way, Saul was a carnal, earthly, worldly man. So it wasn't wise to actually take counsel from Saul. Uh, As they say in Ireland, give him a rubber ear. Like whatever he says, just let it fly over your head. Because this guy is not in touch with God. He's a compromised king. By the way... I need to say this, because we live in a small world today, because technology has given us the ability to access information at the press of a button, there's never been more pressure on young people in this generation to conform to the liberal agenda out there today. Go on, turn on the media, turn on social media, and it's hitting you flat in the face. This is what you're meant to believe. And this is what you're not meant to believe. And if we are not very intentional, you're going to hit a lot of icebergs. That's why Romans 12, 2 instructs us, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, J.B. Phillips paraphrases this passage. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your mind from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. Remember, the will of God is not you arriving at a place where you feel ready or you feel equipped to serve God. It's normally the opposite. I talk to men of God all the time, and it's normally when you feel inadequate or unable or unworthy, whatever it is, that you're normally qualified because God can say, come on, son, come on, daughter. I'm going to take you on this journey, and I'm going to do it for you. When we think we've got it all together, I'm ready. Normally that's just the time that you're about to hit flat on the face. Just hit the ground. So if you do feel that that things just aren't perfect in your life, don't despair. I like what Carter Conlon of Times Square Church says. He says this, We need to enter into the living reality of the one that is able to give us what we could never hope to possess, to take us where we could never go in our natural strength to make us into what we could never be in any of our own designs or plans. Amen? 
Can I say that again? We need to enter into the living reality of the one that is able to give us what we could never hope to possess. To take us where we could never go in our natural strength. To make us into what we could never be in any of our own designs or plans. David basically proved God as a deliverer up in the mountains. He was a deliverer up there. He's going to be a deliverer here. He knew that the God of the mountain was also the God of the valley. People talk today about mountaintop experiences and valley experiences. Well, guess what? He's the same there as he is there. The only thing is we feel good up here, and here we sometimes feel empty. But our feelings don't come into it. We're not governed by feelings. In fact, if you are, you'll, you'd never do anything for the Lord. I woke up this morning, and honestly, I felt dark. I felt like the devil was in my bedroom. It was like dark, spiritually dark. And all I had to do was fight through until I come to this pulpit. Why? Because I wasn't going to be governed by feelings. There's a tendency in young people to hide you know, behind adults or those around them that are older. And that's because maybe they feel intimidated to step out. Or they ride on the experience of their older family members or more mature believers. But they have to prove God personally themselves. Um, these young men in this church, these young women in this church, they are the church of today. And they are servants of the Lord today. God forbid that we would disdain them or mock them just like, like the different discouragements that David got. That we would say, oh, well, in 10 years time, you'll be able to serve God. They can serve God in this house today. Amen? And I trust as a, a, a child of God, you would encourage those that are younger to be doing something in the work of God. By the way, Saul's armor looks the part. It looks more impressive. It appeals to the carnal mind. And we know the story. David confronted the Goliath and he slew Goliath and he won a mighty victory. Not just for himself, but for Israel. Charles Haddon Spurgeon also says, David was confident that God was with him. He was confident also that he is with God. He was confident that God would help him. Confident that he was enabled to do valiantly in years gone by, by the divine help, and that he will do so again. And so he came forward to meet the present emergency. What about the little boy, real quick? Do you remember the little boy that approached Jesus when the 5,000 needed fed? There was no food in the house apart from a small picnic in this little boy's lunchbox. He presented these five barley loaves and two fishes to Jesus. Now, Andrew, the disciple, who was a good man, said what probably everybody else was thinking. What are these among so many? Like, there's 5,000 people here need fed. Uh, and this little boy with his picnic is not going to feed 5,000 people. Okay? So naturally, this thing looked absurd. I mean, it looked ridiculous. Well, what is the answer to that question? What are they among so many? What is the answer to that? In your opinion... What are these among so many? What would your opinion be? Little is much when God is in it. Amen? Would you agree? I mean, that would be the perfect answer. If Jesus was here and there was 5,000 people and a little boy come along, knowing what we know now, we'd all be going, yep, that's enough. That's enough. But yet, there's so many times in life 
where there's the same enormous task and we've got our little whatever. Mm-hmm. And we're like, no, I can't do it. Th- this here's not enough. Well, how do you know it's not enough whenever you haven't stepped out and proved that it's not enough? So it's okay for us if Jesus was physically here, but I can tell you he's spiritually here this morning. He could take anything in this house this morning that seems small, inadequate, and unusable and use it for his glory. That's the God we serve. As believers, we often disqualify ourselves and then the miraculous doesn't happen and it's because that we limit God. I think there's a lesson in here this morning. Both of these situations in the natural looked silly, impossible, absurd. You know, this young man who was standing here may have been overlooked by many in the congregation, but he wasn't overlooked by Jesus. Our Lord actually brought him to the fore and used him as an instrument to meet the need. His little insignificant provision was a means of feeding a large crowd. Do you know what that tells me? Jesus cares for the young kids in this church. If he was here this morning, I just imagine him sitting here and all the kids sitting around him. On his knee. And then him telling a story and using one of those kids as an example. I don't know about you. That's the Jesus that I see. Oh, I would love to be up there sitting beside him. That's what the disciples were like. They were all fighting over who's going to be on his right hand and who's going to be on, on his left hand and all this stuff. And these kids weren't even into that. They were just happy to, to be with him. Just to, even, They were happy just to sit there with him. Because they were running to him. We know that because the disciples were going, get away, get away. Shoo. What, what did he say to them? Whenever they're, go, go back to your mums. Go on. That's probably what they were saying. Suffer the little children to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of God. And I'm just saying, sometimes we just have to really step back and realize, don't underestimate that little child that's sitting beside you this morning. How God can use him to absolutely rock a nation. I mean, there could be a president sitting in here this morning. Literally. Do you believe that? I mean, the pastor who was there preaching to Abraham Lincoln, when he was a little child, probably didn't think, oh, well, he's, a, he's going to be a, a great president someday. You know, this confirms what we've been told for years. God is not looking at our ability. He's looking at our availability. Are you available? Is God able to use you to whatever extent in this day? As I come to close. God can very easily and very effortlessly multiply your little insignificant contribution this morning. He can multiply that. And he can multiply it to the degree that it could have a big impact in this hour. That's what happened here. Granted, it might have looked the opposite, but this young lad found himself in the right place at the right time with the right provision. Does the Word of God not say in Ephesians 3.20, Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Amen? Do we believe that this morning? Or are we just reading an ancient story that has no relevance to us today? Does this, do these stories mean anything to us? Do they stir us up? Do they give us a revelation of God's truth? Or does it just, is it just, just another story? Like, yeah, that was back then, but we're now. What we have to do is those stories are there to actually be quickened to us so that we can apply the truths to today. Amen. 
You know, we should never get captivated with our supply. We should get captivated by the one who's going to use that supply. So if you're looking at yourself and feeling unworthy, join the club. And then you're looking at what you're equipped with and you're even more discouraged. Just look above and look at the one who can touch that little and make it much. That's what I get from this. That's what I see when I, I read the Word of God. And by the way, that's the story of Scripture. And just a little side note. The thing that stands out to me in regard to the boy's response to the need is that he gave everything he had. He could have said, no, that's my lunch. There's, there's no way that I... My mom made me this this morning and guess what? Mine. Just like you were when you were a little child. Mama said, share it with the rest of your siblings. Come on. Mine, daddy. Mine, mommy. Mommy. He could have been like that, but he wasn't. He gave everything that he had, even though it seemed small, he gave it all. And when you see that in Scripture, you know that God can use that, like the widow's mite, or the widow's two mites. She didn't have much, but she gave everything she had. And I'm telling you, when you haven't much, but you give what you have, I'm telling you, it touches the heart of God. It really touches the heart of God. This young boy was a giver. So, can I remind you as we close, God uses simple, ordinary, imperfect people to accomplish extraordinary tasks. Are you willing to be used? Are you willing to be used today? Let us pray. Is there someone here this morning and God's been dealing with you about proving Him, about serving Him, about being more active for Him? Maybe you're holding back for whatever reason. Maybe you're one of the many unemployed Christians there is throughout America that can diagnose the problem but are not there trying to meet the answer. It's easy to curse the darkness out there. It, it's easy. Just look, look at where our country's going and it's easy to curse the darkness. But it's a lot harder to step forth like that little boy and say, here, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to meet the need, Lord. God can only use us if we're willing. I want to challenge you this morning. Are you doing what He wants you to do? Are you being who He wants you to be? Are you active? Are you actually proving God is God? The only way you're going to prove God is God is by stepping out into a task that is impossible. That's beyond you. It's too much for you. It's, it's just there's no way that you can work it out. Most of us kind of sit on the boat and we analyze and critique Peter as he gets out of the boat and he walks by faith. And then when Peter stumbles, then we're, oh, told you so, told you so. I told you he was imperfect. I told you that he had his shortcomings. I t told you that Peter is all talk and whatever. Well, at least he stepped out of the boat and made an impact. Just examine in your heart this morning. You know where you are. I'm not asking anyone to lift their hand this morning. I'm just asking, um, just asking you to examine your heart. You know and God knows. We mightn't even know. Lord, when we read stories like this, Lord, it challenges us, Lord, to the very foundation of, and to the core of who we are and what we are. Lord, you want to use us in this day. And Lord, it's so encouraging to know that you use the most unlikely of people to achieve the most powerful of conclusions. I pray that you would use everyone in this house to the extension of your kingdom this morning. God, help us, O oh God. Help us, Lord, to be obedient. Help us to be sensitive, O oh God. When you give us a green light, I pray that we'll go. When you give us a red light, I pray that we'll stop. And Lord, when you give us an orange light, I pray that we'll wait. 
Just help us, O oh God. We need that strength. We need your help, O oh God. Lord, you're strong and we are weak. You're able and we are not able, O oh God. So our confidence today is in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand this morning.